So I'm going to be talking about legal person and rights, as the name says, or the title says, and we'll see how much we get to. But I'm pretty sure that we'll have enough time to cover most of the issues I was hoping to cover. So hopefully most of you already know by now, by now that my name is Lisa Kurki. Yes, that's really my name. <laughs> but it's not after the credit card. It refers to the birch tree, this white tree, you know. Bisak Wave was a type of birch. Um, and I'm currently at the University of Helsinki as a, as a postdoc. And I'm from Turku, Finland originally. So um, the plan was to first give a bit of general introduction to the topic, then discuss what I call the orthodox view of legal personhood, which is like what most law students are taught that legal personhood is all about then try to assess it, whether it is actually a good understanding of legal personhood. And while doing that, I'll discuss theories of rights as well a little bit, and then introduce my own bundle theory of legal personhood. And then finally, I'll hopefully also discuss the question of whether anything can be a legal person. Uh, so for instance, whether business can be a legal person. So it was, it was, some, some, some of the audience were expressing interest in, in the question of rights of nature. So anyway, just very briefly, um, this is probably familiar to most of you, but there are different types of, of jurisprudence, different types of legal philosophy, and what we must have been doing here has been so-called analytical jurisprudence, which can also mean actually two different things, I think. So analytical jurisprudence can mean on the one side. One sense it means jurisprudence in the analytical tradition, so sort of Anglo-Saxon tradition mostly. On the other hand, it can be <coughs> clarificatory jurisprudence. So we're trying to clarify concepts. It's not normative jurisprudence, we're trying to say that what law should be like or, or whether animals should have rights or something like that. And this lecture will also mostly be on analytical jurisprudence, but it's not on general jurisprudence, meaning these very general questions about what is the nature of law, but rather on what is sometimes called particular jurisprudence. So uh, analysis of specific legal concepts. So for instance, analysis of rights would be an example of particular jurisprudence or causation. Uh, philosophy of criminal law, I take it, can be understood as particular jurisprudence and, and, and so on. I think this is also a particular jurisprudence in the sense that, in another sense, which is that I don't think legal personhood is necessarily, necessarily an essential feature of all legal systems. It might be, but I don't know. Um, so this is mostly focused on legal personhood as a feature of Western law. Go ahead. I have a question. What are others? Uh, questions that would slow in general. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess that covers all of it, but then there are like different elements of it, you know, whether law is necessarily connected what to morality. Is, and, what's normativity of the law? And yeah, yeah. Things like that. Yeah, yeah. Quite a lot. Yeah, yeah. But, but I guess those would all, all be covered by the question what is law in one sense, I guess. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Oops. So just a brief background, why, why am I interested in legal personhood? So almost a decade ago, ago, I wrote a master's thesis on animal rights and animal legal personhood and uh, back in Helsinki. And there I encountered this almost universal assumption that even though we protect animals by law, animals do not currently hold legal rights because they are not legal persons. So for instance, Stephen Wise wrote in 2010 that only legal persons count in courtrooms or can be legally seen, for only they exist in law for their own benefits. I think it should be benefits. Legal personhood is the capacity to possess at least one legal right. Accordingly, one who possesses at least one legal right is a legal person. But as I was writing it, writing the thesis, I developed this sort of nagging feeling that why exactly don't animals hold rights? What exactly is, is, is missing? Um, and well, we'll get back to that. But why can't we say that because we protect animals, they have rights? So I'll get back to the orthodox in a bit as well, but, but this would be sort of the 
some of the tenets of the orthodoxy of legal person. So there are two types of, of legal persons, natural artificial persons, what um, continental lawyers like to call subjects of law as well. Um, and then there's things, so what sometimes are called objects of law. And only persons can have rights and or duties. And if we then apply this to um, animals, <laughs> well, animals are things. They're not included in this list of persons. So therefore, animals cannot hold rights. And since animals, even though we protect animals by animal welfare legislation, this only entails duties for people. It doesn't entail rights for animals. I'm pretty sure that many of you have heard this. Oh, this sounds, sounds familiar somehow. But then, so I became very interested in legal personhood in general. And I wrote a PhD dissertation on it just yesterday. I told, told some of the teachers that my PhD dissertation title was The Theory of Legal Personhood. And they were shocked that people are still allowed to write PhDs like that. <laughs> <laughs> so general, general um, sort of topics. Um, and in that dissertation, I concluded that nothing is missing, that animals actually already hold legal rights. So legal personhood is actually a cluster property. So it consists of various different elements. They don't always come together. And, and when, we, when we say that animals don't have the capacity for rights, we actually normally need private law rights. So animals can, for instance, enter contracts or own property. But that's just sort of one aspect of, of legal person. Animal welfare law is a completely different thing. Anyway, I, I won't be only talking about animal rights here. This is just how I became interested in the topic. Um, Yeah, and by the way, this then, so I think it depends on the country somewhat, but I wrote my PhD in the UK, so in the UK, your PhD is not considered a book in itself, but then it got published as a book later with Oxford University Press 2019, and it's open access now, I guess most of you have had, had, had to read 19 pages out of it. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, here, so when I started my work, there was relatively little interest among legal philosophers um, about legal, in legal personhood as a sort of distinct general topic. <laughs> um, but recently the topic has become much more popular. So there are, um, for, for instance, a couple of edited volumes by yours truly and Tomasz Pechikowski, Brunello San, Sancholi, I think his name is pronounced. Then Nairad Nafin, I think, I always forgot how her name is pronounced. Uh, so she's written a lot of legal person. She's an Australian legal theorist. Um, and Tomasz Pechikowski, I guess many of you to know him, has also written a short book on legal person, but person would be on humanism. And then I'm very much looking forward to Pavel's forthcoming book. <laughs> <laughs> Everything about legal person explained. <laughs> Pavel's postdoc project is on legal persons. So. <laughs> anyway, so so uh, as I as I said, when I started working on it, it was actually still relatively a fringe topic. So when I told some professors that I'm working on legal personhood, some asked me like, why? Why are you doing this? Um, they were very skeptical, but but it's actually become like sort of a, almost a mainstream topic nowadays. So there's a lot of different news articles about, for instance, the work of the so-called Non-Human Rights Project that's um, suing various parties in order to get fundamental rights for animals in the United States and, and Argentina and, and, and so on. Then there are debates about uh, whether, well, I mean, so the Wangana River in New Zealand has been declared a legal person. There's debates about robots, legal personality, and, and, and so on. So it's actually becoming relatively mainstream, and I think legal philosophers are sort of gradually developing an interest in the topic again. It was popular like 
70 years ago. But after that, it, it was the most interesting legal person, at least like in the languages that I can read. So I think it's quite important to distinguish various, well, at least four questions relating to legal personhood. So first, what does it mean to be or a legal person? So this is about the definition of the term or an analysis of the concept. This can also, I'll get back to this later, but this is about the intention with an S of legal person. So, so the definition. Whereas the question of who or what is the legal person is about the extension of, of legal person. So who we human beings are legal persons and corporations are legal persons and so on. This would be somewhat relevant a bit later. Then there's the question of well, what can be a legal person, which I hopefully get toward the end of the lecture. And finally, the question of well, what should be a legal person. And that's then a question of normative jurisprudence. And I'm happy to discuss it with you, but I wasn't going to say that much about it here. Anyway, so who well, or what is a legal person? So I, I, I gave a presentation on this. Was not for a Polish audience, and since I think like three quarters of the people here are Polish, so I thought I'd just leave these Polish terms here. So, because the terminology can be a bit confusing, so especially in English, I think in English it's sort of a mess to be honest. It's, it's much more straightforward in some other languages. But so, legal person, what I mean by legal person is what continental lawyers often also call called subject of law, so Odmio Prava in Polish. <laughs> and it contains two categories, natural persons, Osobe Fizyczna, and artificial persons, Osobe Pravna. Um, but sometimes in English, legal person also only means artificial persons. So sometimes people, when they say legal person, they only mean corporation. So that's, that's confusing. Um, <laughs> But then there are these historical cases regarding who or what is a legal person. So, for instance, slaves were not legal persons, supposedly. That's a, often, that's a claim that's often repeated. Um, women's legal status is varied a lot. Um, but um, at least in many jurisdictions, people think that women have not always been legal persons. And then there are all these new, new questions that I already mentioned. Maybe I'll just mention asylum seekers. So I think the issue with asylum seekers is not whether they are legal persons de jure, but the question is rather whether they are legal persons de facto. So whether they actually have access to, in practice, to their to their sort of the rights pertaining to their legal legal person. Anyway, so what what does it mean to be a legal person? I already mentioned that there's what I call the orthodox view, which says that. A legal person is the subject of legal rights or duties with a capacity for rights. If you have just one right, then you're a legal person. Whereas I then prefer what I call the bundle theory of legal person. So a legal person is a holder of numerous, in, what I call incidents of legal person, but you can call rights and duties in more. So that's for the introduction. Any questions at this point? Go ahead. So do you differ rights and duties as the incidents of legal person? So is it further? So you have, let's say I have 10 rights and I have no duties. Does it differ or I still do have the incidents of legal person? Well, in that case, you would, I mean, 10 rights is probably not enough, but, but um, it's hard to count rights anyway. Yeah, obviously. Yeah, it is. yeah but, but I mean, you would probably be what I call a passive legal person. So like baby. The baby doesn't have any duties, but the baby is still a legal person. So, uh, just to clarify, so does uh, a legal bank be a fully legal person? Yeah. And, uh, I need to have at least one duty, right? No. No. Okay. <laughs> this is a bit misleading, but I'll, I'll get back to it. Yeah. It's good that we have Polish people here who are strict about what and means. <laughs> <laughs> so, let me then discuss the orthodox view of legal personhood. Um, so there are various uh, sort of formulations of the orthodox view. Here are some, 
you, you can find still some others, but, but so uh, according to one definition, what I call the rights or duties view, some X is a legal person, if and only it's X holds at least one legal right or duty. According to another definition, X must be capable of, capable of holding legal rights or duties and or duties. Uh, according to the third definition, X must be capable of partaking in legal relations. Um, and according to a fourth definition, X is legal rights or duties. This is the view of Hans Kelsen, and, and I'll hopefully get back to it later. But this is a bit different from the rest because according to this fourth definition, it's not that X holds rights or duties, rather that X is rights. So X just is a bundle of rights and duties. So for Kelsen, we are human beings, and then there is a person, which is our rights and duties. Um, so again, this is the orthodox inventory then. I think this idea will again probably be familiar, at least with civil lawyers here. So there are, it, it's very natural for us to think that there are, there's like two categories in the world. The, there are persons and things, and that's it. So, so for instance, I noticed that French authors like to call this the, the summa divisio. So there's like, this is everything in a way. This is the highest classification. And then Germans like to say, tertium non dato. So there is no third. This is it. There is no third category. Um, and everyone's either a legal person or subject, and only persons hold rights, rights to things. But I think I've already sort of said this. So here's a more specific example of the orthodox real legal person that I encountered quite early. So for instance, Stephen Weiss, this American um, animal rights lawyer, thinks that you must first be a legal person, then you can have legal rights. After that, you can have a private <coughs> right of action, meaning, I guess, that you can sue, and then level four, you can have legal standing. I must say, I'm a bit confused about the definition or the difference between three and four, but I'm not a common lawyer. Um, so, so he, his, his, his is um, the capacity for rights. So he thinks legal personhood is a precondition for rights. Once you have first you have legal first personhood, then you can start having rights. Um, if you then look at the history, I'm actually going to talk about the history a little bit now. I've noticed that no one else has been interested in the history of, of legal concepts or anything during this summer school, but I thought I'd you know, be a bit less stereotypically analytic in that regard. So very often, People say that they sort of, um, this idea of dividing the world into persons and things comes from the great Roman lawyer, Gaius. So he wrote a textbook called Institutiones, the Institutes, which was a textbook of Roman law and then became a part of Corpus Juris Civilis, which was an important corpus of Roman law. And his, book is structured into three parts, persons, things, and actions. And actions here means like ways of suing. It doesn't mean actions in the sense of, you know, these kinds of actions. Um, but but it, it's actually very misleading to say that this would have originated from Gaius, this sort of summa divisio, because it doesn't contain any kind of claim that everything in the universe is either a person or a thing. For instance, slaves are included both as persons and things and, and so on. It's, 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 a, it's just a mainly pedagogical thing. So a person, the law of persons is about the law, family law and the law of statuses. So meaning that whether you are Roman or non-Roman and, 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 and whether you are the head of the family, pater familias or not, and so on. And, Law of things is about property law, and law of actions is about procedural law. So, Gaius didn't, by the way, I know that's an expert on Roman law, but this is what I've gathered is that he, he didn't really have any idea that, or any plans to create this kind of inventory of the universe. But instead, this division developed 
in the works of scholars who work in the early modern period in continental Europe. So they are really inspired by this uh, Gaia, the works of Gaius, but they then developed it much further. So for instance, we have Hermann Volteus who wrote that persona est homo habens caput civile. So a person is a human being with a civil status. So here we start seeing this sort of more modern understanding of, of that there's a difference between being a human being and being a person in, in, in the law. This is something that the Romans didn't clearly do. Um, and um, the third category of actions gradually diminished in importance. So the categories of persons and things became so more important. But for instance, Leibniz, who actually was a great lawyer as well as many other things, so still employed in this category as well. <clears throat> So here we have one example. So again, the great international lawyer Hugo Grotius also wrote a, a Dutch textbook on, on Dutch law and said that in order to understand rights of persons to things, since law exists between persons to whom the right belongs and between things over which the right extends, we must treat first of the legal condition of persons, secondly of the legal condition of things. So here we are seeing this sort of sort of modern idea that we have persons and things of the two different categories. Then we have the great German philosophers Kant and Hegel, who actually were very much inspired by Roman law and, and legal thinking, which I think many people, I, I wasn't aware of this before I started working on this stuff, that, that they, they they sort of law inspired Kant and Hegel a lot. It's, it's not just that they inspired law, but they were inspired by law. Um, so they um, then, on the other hand, influenced German legal scholarship. But so the idea that Kant and Hegel had, well, was, was the first of all persons are these rational self-reflective beings. And for instance, Kant divided rights into three types. So there's a right to a person, meaning like a person, personal rights, so for instance, a contractual right, that's right to a person. Then there are rights to things, so property rights. And then there is a strange category, so right to a person akin to a thing, which is a bit problematic. So it's a bit like if you say have a child, you can sort of decide child's affairs, even though the child is not a thing, but that's not a very popular category nowadays. Um, and whereas Hegel, on the other hand, wrote that all rights are actually rights of things. So there's an excerpt, rights of every kind can belong only to a person. And seen objectively, a right based on contract is not a right over a person, but only over something external to the person or something which the person can dispose of, i.e. always a thing. So here we're starting to see this sort of strict bifurcation between persons and, and things. So this orthodox inventory that I showed you earlier, you can in a way say that it's a Kantian Hegelian inventory, if you like. And what happened then? Whoops. So these ideas then spread to German legal scholarship, which was the most influential sort of country regarding legal scholarship in the world. So, for instance, Katie Kaufmann Savigny wrote his tr great treatise on Roman law, which was actually on contemporary German law. Um, and he, for instance, as far as I know, coined the term subject, so subject of law. Um, the term had been occasionally used in some different context, but as far as I know, he was the first to use it in this sense. And he also imported the idea of what, what in English can be called legal capacity, capacity for rights, so rechtsfähigkeit. He imported it into law. Again, as far as I know, it was Hegel who came up with this term, 
but that was not in strictly sub legal context. And then, since German legal scholarship was so influential, so this these ideas then spread around <coughs> the Western world. So I haven't looked into like how they spread to each and every country, but but um, for instance, if you can clearly see in the German civil code, there are chapters for persons and things. Um, and um, John Austin, who is a different John Austin than the one that, that I am talking about, um, took it with him to the Anglophone world because he studied in Germany, in Bonn, and so on. I'll show you an excerpt from Austin's book in a bit. And, um, but, but I think it's already important to note here that Savi Deed was interested in private law. That was his main interest. So when he was talking about persons and legal capacity, capacity for rights and so on, this was purely in the context of private law. And this will has become, might become relevant later on. So here is an excerpt from John Austin's uh, book. I take it most of you have heard of John Austin, the legal philosopher. So, so he's the guy who was demolished by heart. <laughs> that, that's how I think most people understand Austin. But, but um, he, so he didn't only write this. So, so, so I think, he, I mean, his sort of most famous work is called Promise of Jurisprudence Determined, which is a very short book. But he wrote, he, or I, I think his wife posthumously compiled his lectures on jurisprudence, which contains a lot of analysis of a lot of different issues. So here he writes, for instance, that human being is the meaning which is given to the term person in familiar discourse. Many of the modern civilians have narrowed the import of the term person as meaning a physical or natural, <coughs> natural person. They define the person thus, a human being invested with a condition or a status and in this definition, they use the term status in a restricted sense, as including only those conditions which comprise rights, and as excluding conditions which are purely onerous or burdensome, or which consist of duties merely. According to this definition, human beings who have no rights are not persons, but things. By the way, I think it's a bit strange that he says that duties are not relevant, because most think that people think that duties are somehow relevant here. Yeah. But, but I, so you can see here that this is like a new idea. So this is like something that they do on the continent. They have this idea that persons are defined in terms of the idea that they hold rights. So it, it, it wasn't like obvious to say common lawyers before that, that personhood equals right holding. That's why I think this is quite a revealing passage. But anyway, so. This was originally an explanation of private law, but then it spread to explain the whole of the law for some, some reason. So, so you, had, you had had like private law lenses that we were using to understand private law, but suddenly you, you would use that, those lenses, that conceptual apparatus to understand the whole of the law. And, and so I, I think especially people in civil law countries, so when they study private law, in, in law school, they are introduced to these concepts, but not as private law concepts, but rather as general concepts. So this is an example from a Finnish textbook. I'm translating it into English here, but one who, according to the legal system, has or can have rights is called a subject of law or a person. And legal capacity means that a person can be endowed with rights and duties because every natural person has legal capacity, every human being can have rights or duties or both. So here again, like this is private law context, it's a private law textbook, but it's presented as a general theory about personhood in every area of, of, of the law. <coughs> right. So this was so background of the orthodox view very briefly. Any questions at this point? Good. I'm 
optimistic that maybe we'll even make it through all my slides. Um, so let's then consider how I started. So, so as I mentioned, I think in the message that Pavel sent sent to you like Sunday or something. So this is sort of stuff that I've, I've been working on. So I could mostly send my own work, which is of course nice because I'm very self-centered. <laughs> um, and, and, and I was thinking that I would talk about some of the methodological issues that I've been um, grappling with and how I sort of solved, solved them. And maybe this will then be helpful even if you're not interested in the person per se. But some, some of the sort of fundamental issues or sort of, I don't know, I wouldn't say assumptions, but, but sort of things that I, in a way, informed my, my understanding of, or my approach was, first of all, what I call lack of deference. <clears throat> so, so, so the legislature and legal scholars and so on can be wrong about how legal concepts should be understood. Um, I think this is in a way obvious for many legal philosophers because the, the point is to improve our concepts, to gain a better understanding of our concepts. So clearly legal scholars and judges can be wrong, but hopefully we'll, in the next lecture, we can actually, we'll, we'll discuss cases where people seem to think that, no, 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 we cannot disagree with the legislature. Um, and another, okay, yeah, go ahead. Uh, no, just a clarification question. When you're saying the point is to improve our concepts, mm -hmm. are, are you aiming is your goal descriptive or normative in the sense that there is this project of concept called engineering? So what, what, what you have, is what you're after like coming up with like a concept that would be more useful given our goals or are you interested in like their descriptive? Yeah, well, it, I would say descriptive, but of course, like, I think there are always some kind of values involved even in descriptive work. So there's some theoretical values in the sense of what is good or what, what is interesting, what is a good theory and, and so on. But I'm, I'm gonna get actually back to this question later on. Um, and then a second issue that um, sort of informed my approach was legal positivism. So even though I disagreed with what many scholars had to say about, and then even the legislature had to say about, say, whether animals have rights, I still think, I still subscribe to legal positivism. And I can see you, you really think that there's like a tension between those two ideas. So legal positivism is the claim that, you know, legislature decides, but then I, I, could, I, I still said that the legislature was wrong in some cases. And, and I hope to discuss some of these sort of, why I think you can combine these two, but, but it'll, in, through the next lecture. Another difficulty was that the orthodox view can be seen as a stipulative view, or if not st stipulative, then at least a view that is true by definition. So, so what I mean by this is that you can't really provide any empirical evidence against the orthodox view because all right holders are by definition legal persons. So, so if, 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 um, if I then come along and, and say that, um, no, 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 animals also hold rights, even though they're not legal persons, then, they, then, it, then an orthodox view adherent can say that, well, no, they don't because by definition, only legal persons hold rights. Or then they can say, okay, well, then animals are legal per persons by definition. So in a way, you can't empirically refute the orthodox view. Um, so, so, so the only thing I had to do, and by the way, this is sort of one thing that my supervisor was constantly sort of challenging me about, so it was like, what exactly are you doing? Like, what is your methodology? How exactly are you challenging the orthodox view? And I, and I had an idea sort of in my head, but it was hard to specify it exactly. 
But I, what I wanted to do was to argue that it's a problematic definition. We should change the definition. But it then took a while to, to get there. But uh, so I tried to argue that this definition does not manage to capture some relevant aspects of the phenomenon. Of course, this was an immodest analysis then. So after, after hearing the lecture yesterday, I was thinking, how exactly does this modest, immodest distinction apply to particular jurisprudence? But anyway. <clears throat> Um, but yeah, so, so this was sort of maybe one of my main arguments. So this is in chapter two of the book. So there is, a, I didn't call it by the way, the discrepancy argument. So actually this was, um, Rebus recently had a symposium on my book and Maya Aldoheinel and Juha Karvo call this the discrepancy argument, um, which I think is a good, good title for label. So my argument was that there are sort of discrepancies between some important tenets, so some important sort of foundations or important beliefs of modern legal thought jurisprudence. And this discrepancy is between three things. So first, who or what is widely taken to be a legal person, so the extension of legal personhood. And second, who or what holds rights according to modern theories of rights. And third, the orthodoxy. We'll get back to those things in a bit. I'll just tell you a little bit about sort of what rights theory is all, all about. <laughs> so since I think there's one common lawyer in the room, so, so for the first of you, it will be familiar that, that the, sort of word for right that we have in, in civilian thoughts is ambiguous in the sense that, so I mean, coming from the Latin word jus, and when you have recht and bravo and qua and derecho and, and so on. <clears throat> so it can mean a legal order, what we sometimes call objective <coughs> rights or objective law. And then there's, uh, it can also mean justice. Um, and then it can mean right. So sub subjective, subjective use in a way, okay? And in Roman law, <clears throat> there was no clear distinction between this sort of objective, in a way, just um, solution and someone's subjective right. So, so if, if, um, if, um, if A owes something to B, then Romans would not have said that, that, that uh, B has the right to the money, but rather that it is right for a case, and it, it is right for them both. I think I think John Finney says somewhere that that this Roman idea could be in English be expressed a right it, together. So it is a right, like it is all right or something like that. So it, it's like an adverb in a way. So then this theories of, or ideas of subjective rights that you have right to something started to develop in the Middle Ages. Um, and um, the first such theories were will theories. And will theory here means that you have, having a right to something means that you can control it. It's, depend, it's dependent on your will. So I, I own this, I have the right to this mobile phone and it means that I can sell it and do whatever I want to it, destroy it. And so on. And the so, so called interest theory was a relatively late contender. So the interest theory says that when you have a right to something, it means that um, someone has a duty that is beneficial for you. It is in your interests that someone carry out their duty. Or there are there is one other sort of school of interest theories which says that interests justify rights. So so. I think especially if we talk about say, constitution, <coughs> constitutional rights, we can say that our fundamental interests are the justification of those, of the duties flowing from those rights. Um, this was a, a very brief sort of historical background, but, but I was hoping then to focus on sort of a, um, 
why we then theorize about rights and, and what we do when we theor about, theorize about rights. So, so not only is it extremely ambiguous in sort of civil law thoughts that we have, you know, use can I mean objective law, subjective right, and so on. But even in the sort of narrower sense, the word right is used in various different senses, and I'll get back to that in a second. Um, so the way I understand what the point of theorizing about rights is then is first what I call dissection. So you sort of try to pick apart these different ways of talking about rights. So analysis. And then what I call reconstruction. So trying to provide better, less ambiguous, more precise definitions that somehow increase our understanding of, of something. Okay. So this is what I think theories of rights to be all about. Um, so here's then Wesley Newcomb Hofeld, uh, American jurist who didn't live very long, but he wrote two important articles, some fundamental legal conceptions, blah, 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 and fundamental legal conceptions, blah, blah, blah. I don't remember the rest, as, as applied in juridical reasoning or something like that. Um, um, and his idea was to provide sort of a toolbox for analyzing rights. So, so um, but I should also mention that Hopel didn't sort of just come up with this out of, you know, nothing. I mean, he had many predecessors who had already presented similar analyses, but he then sort of improved upon those analyses. I think people sometimes present Hofeld as, as being some kind of a genius that, you know, alone came up with the scheme, but that's not really true. Um, anyway, so I think this is the basic idea of Hofeldian analysis. So if we say that Peter has a right to receive 100 euros or 1,000 euros from Anna. So if Anna owes Peter 1,000 euros, then this sort of everyday, um, which in a way would seem to be a single right, actually contains various things within it. So it contains uh, Anna's duty to pay 1,000 euros to Peter. It contains Peter's competence to sue Anna in order to obtain the money. It contains Peter's competence to waive the debt. It contains Peter's competence to sell the debt to a third party and so on. So actually when we say that someone has a right to something, there's actually a lot of things sort of embedded within that sentence. And what Hofeld then did was to provide a sort of, because you know, I'm from a Nordic country, so we like Legos. So, so, um, so if in everyday language, when you talk about rights, you know, it contains a lot of different stuff. Hopefully the idea was to, you know, pick apart those different Lego blocks and, and, and sort of analyze them separately. So here are then, I'm, a, I'm not going to go through all of the details of this analysis, but just some central ideas. So some meanings of right. So what it means to hold a right. So one is what is usually nowadays called liberty, um, which, which Hofeld calls a privilege, which I think is someone sometimes more helpful to call permission. Um, so if you have a liberty to something, you could call it liberty right if you want. So this is one sense of a right. So uh, this means that something is not prohibited or something is not commanded. So you are allowed to do something or you are allowed to refrain from doing something or both. Um, so for instance, in, in Finland, there is something called the every man's right. I guess in English, you could call it the right to roam. So you are allowed to roam freely in forests, even other people's forests, and you're allowed to freely pick berries and mushrooms and so on in those forests. Um, so this, so if we say that I have the right to pick berries in other people's forests, this is primarily about what I am allowed to do. 
it is not at least primarily about anyone's duties, for instance. I mean, we can then think of duties. So, for instance, if I walk in other people's forests, they're not allowed to come and punch me or something like that. But those are sort of more general uh, rights uh, against um, against violence. Um, we'll get back to that. But another example of a liberty would be negative freedom of religion. So I guess maybe for positive freedom as well. But so um, I guess the way it's normally understood is that you, you don't you are allowed not to exercise religion. <laughs> so so you do not have a duty to exercise religion. This is as far as I understand what ne negative freedom of religion normally means. <clears throat> okay, so this is one meaning of right um, in everyday language. Um, secondly, there's something called the claim or claim right. And, and this is, uh, many people think that this is the most central type of right. Some say that this is, the, this is really the only, only right. Um, and a claim right is the correlative of someone else's duty. So, um, so if, if uh, you have the duty not to punch me, so that means I have the right not to be punched by you. So this, this is a claim right. Um, what's typical claim rights is, for instance, that they can be infringed. So you can, um, or like, break or I mean not follow your duty by punching me and that means if you <coughs> infringe your duty you infringe my claim right you have wronged me um oops there's some Swedish left there um right to education well in Swedish it's red to root in Finland is bilingual and I also teach in Swedish <coughs> so right to education in the sense that normally if we say that children have right to education, this does not only mean that children are allowed to educate themselves, but rather it means that someone else has the duty to provide that education to the children. That's actually, at least in Finland, it's a positive right, meaning that other people have the, not only duties of non-interference, but also positive duties of assistance. Okay. Um, the third meaning of right is called a power or a competence. The power is more of the Anglo-Saxon term, and I think civilian jurists often prefer the term competence. And this means the capacity to change the legal situation. So the capacity to say change someone else's duty to a liberty. So if if you have the duty to pay me 500 euros, and I say you don't have to pay. And, and if this is like a valid exercise of competence, then I've changed your duty to pay me 500 euros into the liberty not to pay 500 euros. You have, you're no longer required to pay me 500 euros. Um, so for instance, if we think of the right to make a last will, a testament. So if we say that five-year-old children um, um, don't have the right to make a last will. We're not saying that if they make such a document, then we will punish them somehow. That's not what we're saying. We're saying that, uh, that they cannot do it. If they type up their last will and then sign it, it's not valid, at least in Finland. So this is about what you can do rather than what you're allowed to do. And then finally, there's something called an immunity, but so, so you're protected against changes. Um, so someone else cannot change your legal situation. Someone else lacks the competence to change your legal situation. Okay. So I was hoping to somewhat activate you here. So how would you say this in Hovelbia? We have then so to say dissected rights talk, we have found out that there are different ways we talk about rights. Then the question is like, what 
is a good way. What 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 what's the most justifiable way of talking about rights? Um, so most scholars and think that claim rights, if we had to pick one category only, in order to be clear, so that we, we when we talk about rights, we only want to refer to one category, so there is no danger of confusion. Which category should we pick? Well, many scholars say that claim rights are most important because even in like our everyday thinking, we normally say that rights and duties come, you know, come hand in hand or something like that. And this is this refers to a claim right. So, so if I have the duty not to assault, then this is correlated by the claim right not to be assaulted. <clears throat> but the difficulty here is that um, it's actually quite hard to define a claim right. It's quite intuitive for us. So, in the sense that uh, you know, I think at least for most of you, it's intuitive to say that if if this guy has the duty not to assault this guy, then this other guy has a right. But it's not exactly clear how these two positions relate to each other. And then I already mentioned these two theories. So, um, so according to the will theory, in sort of modern jurisprudence, these are usually competing explanations of claim rights. Okay, so so they then offer two different explanations of what the claim right is. Um, so if we um, so according to will theory, claim rights are protected choices in in the sense that um, I have the duty to um, teach at the summer school. Then maybe Pavel has the right that I teach here. Pavel can just demand that I teach if I sort of don't show up. Pavel can also, uh, um, in a way, weigh my duty. So, so, so if Pavel sees one of my earlier lectures and he decides that it's maybe not a good idea to have me teaching here, then he can then weigh it. So this would be like the real theory explanation of, of, of a claim right. And <laughs> The will theory is generally quite restrictive about rights in the sense that it normally doesn't, I mean, sort of in a sort of traditional hardcore form. The will theory is quite skeptical of children's rights, of animal rights, and so on. So they, some will theorists would say that babies don't have any rights. They would, of course, not say that we don't protect babies. But they would say that these are not rights because babies can't control anyone's duties themselves. They might have legal representatives, and they probably do, but they don't do it themselves. Well, then, like many more recent will theorists would then say that, well, well, I mean, if, if they have representatives, that's fine. But that's actually then a quite a relaxed view then. But, but traditionally, it would be a very sort of a strict view that, um, so, so for instance, Savigny was quite skeptical. He was a will theorist, and he was quite skeptical of the idea that children already have rights. <clears throat> okay. And then there's the interest theory, which I prefer myself, but, uh, but, um, Still prepared to be convinced that they are wrong. Um, but so, according to the interest theory, um, rights and duties are connected in the sense that, um, well, you have the duty not to punch me, and I have the, the right not to be punched because that duty benefits me. It's in my interests not to be punched. Okay, so if we think like that. Children's right to be nurtured or to be fed or to be educated, something like that. It is in the children's interests. And that's why children can have rights, according to the interest theories. So then there's a problem here with interest theory. Where exactly do we draw the line? Um, so Adam, who made the point about that we protect all sorts of things, and, and I guess we did as well. So we protect 
we, tell, we protect, I don't know, paintings and we protect uh, trees and we protect anything. So where, where do we draw the line then? So if, if we are not allowed to cut down some tree, does it mean that the tree then has a right not to be cut down? Or, 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 or if we have a duty not to mistreat animals, does it mean that the animals then have the rights not to be mistreated? Well, the English theorists would normally say that, uh, so, so it depends somewhat on who you ask. I, I think the better question, or the, or the, it's enough to ask what these have interests. Because I, I'm quite restrictive about interests myself. I would say the trees don't have interests because the trees don't have subjective well being, for instance. The trees don't experience the world broadly. I mean, it's an empirical question. Um, and therefore, trees cannot have rights. Whereas animals um, do have a subjective well being, they, what, how the world is matters to them. Um, as personal subjects of life, where it doesn't for trees. So, and, so I think another way of trying to pump intuitions is to talk about wronging. So can we wrong trees? If I cut down a tree, have I actually done something wrong to the tree itself? People might have different intuitions about this. Uh, there's a classical counter example for each of you. I don't give up that case, but it goes like that. Uh, <clears throat> we have the right to inheritance, so inheritance is state. Mm -hmm. And even if the value of the state is negative, mm -hmm. so I don't have, have any interest to inherit, but anyhow, every yeah. lawyer would say, you have the right to, right. to, to inherit. You know? So, so <clears throat> that is my recollection from my study time that was something like 50 years ago. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's why I don't remember the details. Right. Yeah, so that's, um, I don't know if there's like a Polish legal theory uh, and as well, but in sort of English speaking legal theories, for instance, I think Neil McCormick has written about that. I mean, he was an interest theorist. And, 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 and I think the traditional answer would be that, which is something that I haven't said here, but so rights are not about what is in your interests, but what is typically in your interests. Uh, so that would be the, the answer. Um, because of course, like all sorts of good things can be bad for you in a specific situation. Oh, sorry. Uh, yes. So I wonder whether uh, having an interest uh, is a necessary or sufficient condition to attribute right mm -hmm. to something, someone. So here we are talking about, if we talk about legal rights, mm -hmm. then this is. <laughs> It's necessary in the sense that um, merely because, let's say, that animals have, say, the capacity to have rights. It doesn't mean that they actually have legal rights, because that depends on whether we actually, you know, how, how we legally treat them and so on. So it would be necessary. It's sufficient for the capacity to have rights, or some would say to be a potential right holder. Yeah. So, right. It's just, so we have three minutes left. and. Briefly say what exactly these theories are about then. So just some like methodologically. So, so this is a matter of explication. I don't know if you've heard this term, the students. So, so explication usually in, in philosophy means that you can sort of contrast explication with stipulation. So stipulation means that you just present the definition. So this is what I mean by X. And you don't care if it, if people think that sounds weird or anything like that, which is saying that this is my stipulated definition about X. Um, but explication means that you take an everyday concept, uh, like right, and then you try to provide a better definition of it for some purposes. And, and how is it better? Well, it should be simple, uh, as simple as possible. That's a good thing if it's simple. Then it, there's this sort of desideratum of consilience or fruitfulness. So it should, it should sort of explain something. So it should be useful in explaining something. It should be connected to other concepts in some relevant way. Um, 
uh, it should be as close to everyday or every everyday understanding of rights as possible. So, for instance, interest theorists always bash will theorists about the fact that some will theorists deny that children have rights, and then interest theorists say that well, that's really counterintuitive. That's like you depart from our everyday understanding of rights a lot by saying that. So that's a problem for you. And then the will theorist could say that, yes, but but this is actually a much better definition. So we realize this is very different from how we commonly understand rights, but we gain increased conceptual clarity by doing this. So they, they sort of disagree on the criteria for what is a good definition. So, but at any rate, it's not in any way obvious who has won the definition rages on. And I, I recently wrote a super technical paper of defending the interest theory, and I'm sure like three people will read it, but because <laughs> it's getting very, very technical. Um, it's going to be out of legal theory soon, hopefully. Um, so, so but, but we don't have to sort of pick sides here necessarily in order to go back to so, sort of says the orthodox view of legal personhood. So what I did in my PhD and my book, so I tested the orthodox view against both of these theories. 